<clears throat> Hello, friends. Welcome to the Cold War Prepper. And tonight we're doing our nonfiction science uh, post-apocalyptic uh, fiction, nonfiction book club. Golly. <clears throat> Trying to get rid of a little bit of this. Uh, one of my favorite candies, uh, that and what's the other one? Um, comes will be flat packages uh, from Germany. I, just one of the bad things about being in the military uh, in Germany is all the great food you get addicted to, the great coffee, pastries, uh, candies. Oh, my gosh. It's just phenomenal, great stuff. So it's sticking to my teeth, so I'm sorry. Um, Clarity Jane, welcome. Good evening. Cats and Prepping, good evening to you. Welcome. Um, gosh, this is kind of like two exciting um, chapters tonight, in, in a sense, <clears throat> because they're kind of in, in, in uh, opposition to each other. They're basically, do we flee or do we stay? Uh, do we uh, hunker down or do we bug out? And uh, so that's kind of the two chapters we're going to be talking about tonight. I've got two tabs ready that I want to share with you after we get to about the two or three minute mark and we get more people. Hi, Pat Butler. Welcome. Uh, after we get a couple people in here, then I'll show you a couple of tabs uh, that I think are important. I think you should keep bookmarked and uh, take a look at them. You know, just uh, I, I, I look at windy.com every morning just to find out what the prevailing winds are. And I'll show you the other one you can play some games with and, and get some things on it as well. Uh, Straight Kitten, welcome. Good to see you. Terry and Radar's World, good evening. Welcome. We are the Resistance. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, well, thank you. It's, I'm glad you're here for the first live. Um, so just a couple of real quick rules. All I ask is uh, that you be kind, polite, and respectful to each other. Uh, if it, please don't, uh, don't castigate anybody on, on religion uh, race, anything like that. I, I, we are here to build a new community, to build a community of loving, caring individuals who are here to help each other survive um, in a post-apocalyptic world. That's going to require that we do things differently than what we're doing them now. And one of those is that we need to be kind to each other. We need to be polite and respectful. We need to hear the other person out. We don't want to push people away by, by uh, uh, <clears throat> disagreeing with them over religion, politics, or anything like that. I, somebody asked me if they, I, I would give my opinion on some of the things that are going on in the world. I try to stay out of that. Uh, I don't want to, number one, I don't want to be a chicken little. Number two, I don't want to turn people off. Uh, I don't want to scare people. What I want to do is I want to give us the resilience, the knowledge, and the motivation uh, to where we can go on, where life can go on after whatever is going to happen is going to happen. So please, um, you know, uh, if you have something negative to say about something or, or something negative to say about somebody else, <clears throat> just think it, okay? Go ahead and type it and then hit delete or hit erase or whatever, but just don't, don't, don't post it. Now, if I make a mistake, okay, if, if you know for a fact that what Lee just said is bull poo poo, make sure you put it down there and let's get it corrected because I only want the right information to go out to people. Uh, I don't want uh, poor information to go out that is going to uh, uh, cause people an inability to survive or to thrive in a post-apocalyptic world. That's not what we're here for. We're here to get good information out so that we can all get through this together. Okay. So let's see. Um, let me let me start off with sharing these two. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, these two screens I want to share real quick. So share screen, and then I want to show you first Windy Map. Um, so this is the Windy Map. I go to this every uh, day when I wake up first thing in the morning, and uh, so. Uh, we've got right now this evening, if you notice the direction of the winds, okay, this is, um, we're talking about wind speed down here. So it's getting pretty high down here. Remember, they just got, Acapulco just got hit 
uh, with a, a hurricane. Oh my gosh, Acapulco has been torn up. But right now, since we're right about here, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more concerned about anything coming down from the Dallas area uh, as far as a nuke into my area. Uh, you know, notice up here in Lubbock, which is where Pantex is, that's the largest uh, nuclear weapons facility in the U.S. Uh, that's kind of going back up towards the north, so we're safe there, okay? Uh, let me get to another one here. And I should have hit that other key, but I made a boo-boo, so that's okay. We can we can do that. We can we can we're allowed to make boo-boos every once in a while. So now I want to show you this one. This is a fun one. This is a if you want to play around and get some some uh, theory and everything else. Uh, this is called Nuke Map, and the if you look up here, the uh, website is nuclearsecrecy.com/nukemap. So you can, and it comes out generic automatically on Washington, D.C. So I'm going to move that. Um, well, let's move it to where I used to work. Let's just go up here a little bit. We're going to go up. Uh, let me see. There's College Park. Uh, so this should be the Baltimore Washington Parkway here. I'm going to come up here to Laurel, Maryland, right there. There's Laurel. There's 198. That's the front gate to Fort Meade. So here's the front gate to Fort Meade, 32 right here. So right there is where I used to work. Um, so we're still on Fort Meade. And so right there, uh, you've got the Maya Angelou Academy. And then this whole area right down in here between 32 and the Baltimore Washington Parkway. That's where I used to work. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that as our epicenter, and I'll show you how this works. So all of a sudden, we're going to put it right there. We're going to select a, uh, a warhead yield. So remember that there are two different yields, basically. You're going, if you use an ICBM or a uh, short uh, intermediate range ballistic missile, you're going to have a smaller warhead than you will with a bomb. So you can take a preset here, and we, let's just take it down here. We're going to use the heaviest bomb that's ever been uh, dropped. It's a 100 megaton bomb by the Russians. You'd have to have a Tupolev 95 drop it on you. Uh, that's going to be a Tu-95. Probably won't happen here. It's not going to happen inside the U.S. Our, our air defenses are too great. Uh, so we got the one um, megaton or 100 megaton bomb, and we're going to do an air burst here, and we're just going to detonate. So now that we've detonated it right directly over the National Security Agency, uh, we see now that basically what it's going to do is this is going to give us the area of maximum damage. We're going to have some overpressure in this area and then some burning and things going on in this area. And then you're going to have some damage, but not major damage out as far as past Baltimore and up towards Bel Air, Maryland. Okay. Now we're going to do the exact same thing, same bomb and everything else, but we're going to change it from an air burst to a surface burst. Now, remember, with an air burst, you have maximum destructive power. With a surface burst, you're going to get the maximum amount of radioactive fallout. So, uh, and here we're going to look for radioactive fallout. So we're going to detonate now. So what it's going to give you is it's going to give you the same thing we had before, plus it's going to give you the radioactive effects. And as we do that, it also gives you the cloud here so this orange area you see here, and this orange area here is basically going to be the fallout zone of a bomb that was, uh, of a nuclear bomb that was de uh, detonated directly over uh, the National Security Agency, okay? So that's something the fun play with. You can take a look at your home uh, and what's going on at your home and uh, what would happen with, or, or a target that's close to your home uh, as far as, um, you know, how safe would I be if they used a, a bomb of a typical size? I would say use the typical ICBM or the typical S, uh, short range uh, SRBM or the intermediate range IRBM uh, nuclear uh, uh, warheads. And then just project, you know, if there's a, if you, if there's a military facility or a, 
a 700,000 foot long runway close to you, drop it on that and then see what the effects are going to be around you. Okay. And that will kind of give you an idea now, as we start talking about, do you bug out or do you hunker down uh, some ideas as to what you might want to start considering doing now? So uh, I was watching Gerald Skousen. Uh, he is just one of those great guys that has all kinds of great ideas. He wrote a book or two or three about nuclear fallout and nuclear sh shelters and everything else. Uh, he was also just recently interviewed for the third or fourth time on Canadian Preppers Channel. And he had a lot of good stuff to say. But, uh, you know, if we take a look at evacuation and if we take a look at hunkering down, we have to ask ourselves two different questions in each one of those two fields. Uh, uh, let me see here. What would you consider viable targets if you don't live too close to a base? Um, I think that the majority of the, yeah, I, I got that. We are, yeah, we are the resistance that uh, uh, made sense. You know, I, I, I transposed that in my mind. Um, I, I do the finger, the wrong finger on the right key all the time too. So don't worry about it. Uh, I got it. Um, but anyhow, um, I would say, you know, take a look for number one, military targets. Number two, uh, do they have a production capability that's going to be supportive of a w industrial uh, industrial complex that's going to be supportive of the war environment afterwards? Uh, then number three, uh, are there runways over seven, seven what was that? 700,000 foot runways is what they said we need to uh, land and take off. Gosh, my hair, I can't, just can't do anything with it. Of course, I was taking a nap before we came on too. Um, but... Um, and then after that, maybe a major population center, I'd say they're probably going to hit maybe uh, if they want to take out the population, they're probably going to take out the 10, 25 largest cities in the U.S. Uh, so, you know, might take a look at those. How close are you to those and do the, uh, um, you know, the proximity of those. But those, that, that's probably what I would consider. If not, you, especially Minuteman silos, Minuteman silos in the three primary Air Force bases, Minot Air Force Base up in uh, uh, North Dakota. You've got um, Whiteman Air Force Base in southwestern Missouri, and then you've got Dias Air Force Base in Abilene, Texas. Those are the three primary bases that have our B-1, B-2, uh, B-52 uh, bombers. And so that's th those are definitely going to be targets. So I would say those are going to be, plus all the uh, um, ICBM launch sites, Arkansas, North Dakota uh, and, and that area, Colorado, uh, you know, in that area, Wyoming. Probably the nuke sub, our, our submarine bases and our submarine communications bases. There's one in Washington, a very low frequency transmitter. There are two on the East Coast, one on the border between Georgia and South Carolina and one up in Maine. So those are going to be the ones I'm going to be concerned about that I would, I would not want to be too close to. I'm only an hour away from Fort Hood. They aren't going to hit Fort Hood with a nuke. There's no need to. Uh, Fort Hood is not not going to come into play in, in a nuclear war at all. Uh, so they, they probably will not waste that there. Okay, let's take a look at Chapter 4, evacuation. Um, one of the things that I started to say, one of the things that Gerald Skousen says, and I wholeheartedly agree with him, is that if he were the enemy, what he would do is he would throw up an EMP. Now, remember, for an EMP to be effective, it has to be at least one megaton, and it has to be at least at an altitude of 25 miles above the, above the Earth. That's going to have a radius probably of somewhere between 250 and 500 miles, and uh, that's going to have maximum EMP effect in that area. So if you do that, um, McDill is, is basically the home of the Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, so those are all ground pounders. You know, those are, those are uh, even though they're special forces, they probably are not going to be anything of a threat in a nuclear war. Um, you know, your traditional military, Fort Ord, Fort Hood, no, Fort Ord doesn't exist anymore, Fort Bliss, uh, Fort Sill, uh, Fort Leonard Wood, all Fort Stewart, Georgia, you know, 
McDill Air Force Base, all these places where they take care of the ground pounders, that's not a threat. Uh, I mean, you know, if you've got missiles flying, you're not going to be putting these guys on, on airplanes and trying to fly them overseas to fight a war. Uh, you know, they're going to be hunkering down. Um, possibility. Possibility they're a little on prepper, although I think if they do the EMP first, they don't need to uh, because the major, the major financial centers won't be able to communicate. Remember, everything's in, in dits and da's. Uh, when they communicate digitally. And so if you've taken out the ability to communicate, you know, then they, they are totally worthless. So I don't know what's at Norfolk Naval Base, other than the fact that that's probably the home of the uh, the, the Atlantic fleet, I believe. Uh, yeah, it, it possibly could be a, 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 a target. But Norfolk is so close to D.C., to uh, NSA, to CIA, to, you know, all these other things that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to get residuals from the others. So, you know, they may be they may be hit as well. Uh, Quantico, probably not. Uh, Norfolk, I would say, has a greater chance than, than does Quantico. Um, so anyhow, so the question becomes, well, do you bug out or do you stay in? Well, number one, if they do the EMP first, you're not going to have too much of an advanced warning. We kind of talked about that last week, right? That if all of a sudden uh, there are... You know, your, your communications aren't working. The lights aren't working. You notice that traffic is stopping and all these other kinds of stuff. Let that be a trigger in your mind that says, uh-oh, EMP. I need to get in, indoors. I need to hunker down. I need to protect myself from a possibility of a, uh, a nuclear strike. I would say probably stay hunkered down for at least four hours after, in, after the initiation of an EMP. So um, they have a real nice uh, graph here on, on this page. Uh, there you go, if you can see it. And, uh, but it's talking basically about the, the power of a uh, nuclear explosion and how much fallout distance and everything else, well, how high of an altitude it's going to throw the radioactive uh, dust fallout up into the air. Of course, the higher it goes, the further it's going to disperse out. The smaller the yield, the less altitude. You're not going to have that much of a, of a um, fallout area around the, the target. So that, you know, kind of this uh, graph that's in the book can actually kind of be replicated in real life in that uh, Nuke Secrecy uh, website that I gave you. And you can kind of take a look at it there. It'll be a lot more powerful as far as giving you some ideas about what you're going to do. Um, now, you know, here, here's the problem. Um, we don't think alike. Uh, so, so who has uh, the nukes? Well, right now, the nukes are probably, the major nukes are going to be by, by, by the antagonist of us. Uh, they're probably going to be China, and it's probably going to be, um, let me see. Yes, that's the page 28 diagram. Princess kicking butt, or no, uh, cats and prepping. Um, so yes, um, what was I thinking? I lost my mind. I just lost what I was thinking. Oh, we don't think alike. Okay. So, um, you know, things that we think are going to be logical targets to them may not be the logical targets. They may have other logical targets that they're going to go after other than what we do. Uh, but I will say that in my opinion, uh, what they want to do is they want to take over our resources, our production capabilities. So if they irradiate us with a whole bunch of fallout and a whole bunch of surface bursts, uh, then they won't be able to occupy. They won't be able to take our, our, our land. They won't be able to take our uh, fertile areas where we grow so much wheat and rice and corn and everything else because it'll be irradiated. So in my thinking, you know, if that's what they want, then they're going to do mostly airbursts. Remember, that's maximum initial destructive power. That's what we did to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you want that initial destructive power and less radiation. And I think that's what they're going to do so that then they can come in and occupy us afterwards. So if they do it that way, then that second wave, okay, when they start coming across the border and everything and invading us, that's when they're going to probably use tactical nukes uh, against the Fort Hoods and the Fort Blisses and and, and some of the other places like that, the MacDill Air Force bases and things. Um, so, you know, so 
I wouldn't place way too much credence in your Joel Skousen has a uh, high risk map. Various experts have, have these high risk maps and where you should and shouldn't be. Take a look at them. They're interesting. Uh, but just remember, we're trying to project what we think our enemies, the, the, the uh, um, Russians and the Chinese, we're trying to get into their minds and say, what would they think are the primary targets? Now, um, um, on the other hand, North Korea and uh, uh, Iran, their objective is to wipe us off the face of the earth, and they're going to do it any way they can. Uh, you have to think North Korea, okay? So North Korea invaded the South. We pushed them all the way up, got pushed back, and, and that was when we got pushed all the way down to Osan. Then we pushed them back over almost to the Yalu River again, which is the border of China. The Chinese got involved and pushed us back to the 38th parallel. So we went across that country four or five times, and just everything was leveled. So they hate us for that, even though they started the war. Kind of, you know, kind of deja vu of what we have going on in, in, in Gaza. We want to kick, you know, we're going to, we're going to come on and, and throw sand, sand in your face, but we don't like the consequences of doing that. Same thing happened in North Korea. And uh, so, you know, we've got, we got history kind of repeating itself there. And, uh, but anyhow, uh, those two, they don't care everything's off the table. They don't want to occupy us. They just want to obliterate us. So, you know, depends on who we have as far as uh, protagonists, antagonists. Uh, I saw something from, I no Prince is kicking, but I, I didn't see you say anything wrong. Uh, I, I mistakenly, I thought you were cats and prepping and that's why I, I called you out. I, cats and prepping asked which page we were on and, and, uh, in the book and I was trying to respond to her and I may have given an inference that I thought you did something wrong, but no, I didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't. Um, so, uh, you know, that's kind of where that is. So uh, what are you going to do now? Here's, here's another one of those projections. Now this is basically that windy.com map or, or website that I gave you. So this is prevailing winds for fallout. So if some of those targets, uh, that the, the author here, that, that um, uh, Mr. Kearney thinks are going to be primary targets, and they are ground bursts, this is where the fallout's going to go. Um, you can do just the exact same thing by going to that uh, nuke secrecy site that I gave you. So uh, that's going to be pretty good for you there. Here's the problem, okay? So now let's get down to the crux of evacuation. If you get that... Uh, notification that there's an EMP. If you become aware that there's an EMP, get inside. You don't know where the, the, the strike is headed. So if you don't know where it's headed, you may be headed to ground zero instead of away from. You never know. So remember that a lot of these, we're seeing that upwards to 25% of the rockets that are being launched by Hamas actually fail and come back and hit them instead of Israel. Well, can an ICBM that just traveled 12,000 miles uh, be off by a mile, 10 miles, 100 miles, uh, and strike a target that it was not intended towards, okay? You don't know. So once you get the notification that there's stuff coming in, or you have the assumption based off of an EMP that stuff is coming in, hunker down. That's your best bet. Then gather information. Where did it explode? I looked at my windy map this morning. I know that the wind is coming from that direction. I need to move perpendicular. So if, if, if the wind is coming this way and it blew up down here and I live here, I don't want to go this way. I want to go this way or this way. I want to go perpendicular to the direction of the wind that's going to be carrying that fallout towards me. So if I'm going to evacuate, I want to evacuate perpendicular to the major wind direction. Uh, but that would be after you determine where the bombs were. You're also, here's another problem. Uh, we're going to have a lack of communications. So if I'm assuming that the bomb hit, let's say, Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, and you know the wind is coming up to me from Randolph, 
and I start heading perpendicular to that, uh, to that, and I head up towards Fort Hood, and there happened to be one at Fort Hood's, I could be running into another uh, ground zero. So what I want to do is I want to get, I want to hunker down at home until I have enough information to make a determination of where are the safe zones and where are the hot zones. Once I've made that determination of, am I in a hot zone? Do I need to evacuate? And where are the safe zones? Then I'm going to evacuate and head towards a safe zone. If, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, let me see. Yeah, they, they can be very scary. Uh, so let me see. Okay. Oh, I put the book up. Why did I do that? That was kind of dumb. Um, Okay, then he gives us a fantastic, on page uh, uh, 33, he gives us a phenomenal evacuation checklist. Uh, so he has the most needed items and useful items, um, survival information, tools, shelter building materials, water, goes into great detail in these. So that's why you've got to get a copy of this book. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, peacetime valuables, light clothing, sleeping gear, food, sanitation items, medical items, miscellaneous. I had one of the guys in our group who was over here today, and he and I were talking, and, uh, you know, we were talking about communications. And I said, look, I've got 10 GMS or GMRS radios. So, you know, if you don't, if you haven't gotten yours yet, you know, and, and it happens tomorrow, I've got one for you. But I would prefer that you go get your own so that we can make sure that we have for other people who don't have it. And here's what we're going to do for food for the for the neighborhood. And then, well, we had a real good conversation about uh, hygiene and and what are we going to do with waste disposal. And so he says, well, you know, he says, I don't trust these other people. I need to get some antibiotics. And I said, okay, let me give you two links: one to Jace Medical and one to Contingency Medical. Check them out, uh, and whichever one you want to go with, make sure you get the the uh, one that you think is going to be the best for you. Both of them are superior companies. So he's he went online this evening and he's checking out uh, you know whether he wants Jace or or, uh, or contingency and what he's going to do with them. But anyhow, fantastic evacuation checklist on page thirty three of the book. Um, then we've got some useful items, uh, so for example, additional tools, tents, tentage, and things like that. Um, so then on pages. Uh, well, I guess this is an insert because it doesn't have page numbers. It's it's a, it's an addition to the the 1980 uh, version. And it says just give me an, a list, and so he goes through uh, 12 things that he thinks you should have, and that's kind of an addition since the original uh, version. Uh, it gives some ideas about evacuating by car, um, and they talks about uh, making expedient shelters. So uh, that's kind of chapter four. Then in chapter five, he talks about shelters, the greatest need. Now, when we talk about shelters, there are two different things you want to consider when you're planning a shelter. So number one is you want to be protected against the blast and the thermal radiation. Okay. Now, when I say thermal radiation, I'm not saying radioactive. I'm saying heat. Okay. Because remember that this, this fireball that's going to be erupting is going to be roughly equivalent to the heat of the sun, okay? So there were basically shadows that were burnt into the concrete uh, in, in, in Japan uh, when we dropped those two, the big boy and the fat boy, uh, our tall man. And uh, so, you know, I mean, it's just that the heat is intense. It's going to burn things. It's, even if your face is facing away, there's a chance that it could burn out your retina and blind you permanently. Uh, that's how intense the, the heat and the light are. So that's one thing you have to be prepared against. And the best way to prepare against that is all kinds of mass between you and that very sturdy mass. So if you can get underground, you're better off. There's a picture. Uh, I'm not sure if it's this book. I saw a picture. No, it's not in this book. There is a picture of an underground bomb shelter that was only like a half a mile away from ground zero. 
and I think it was in Nagasaki. Uh, but the people that were in there survived. I mean, they had gone down for some stupid reason, and they survived because they were in there at the right time. Uh, so, you know, you can survive the blast if you're underground and in a blast shelter. You have to be prepared for that high pressure pushing on it. And uh, so you want to make sure that you have a blast proof uh, shelter that you're going to be staying in. Um, so the, the shadow stray kitten where you have a body here and it's basically the same thing as what happened with Mount Vesuvius in, in Pompeii. Uh, so you have this intense amount of heat, and basically the heat is irradiating everything around here, and then it chars this and pushes it down, and what was a body now becomes nothing but char and gets burnt into the concrete or the ground uh, around that area where, where the blast happened. And so that's basically the charred remains of human beings burnt into the ground uh, around the uh, uh, blast. Let me get up here and see. You guys are asking great questions. Let me get up here and catch up. Uh, if they target, so this is a little lone prepper. Uh, if they target nuclear power plants, would there be a danger, danger of spent fuel rods releasing radiation? Yes, but more so than the spent ones, the active ones, okay? Uh, so remember, you have active rods inside of the plant. And then they take the active rods, and they're going to take those every six months, uh, about one sixth of the, because because the fuel rods they use have a have a half life of around thirty six months. Uh, so what they want to do is they want to have a consistent amount of energy. So one sixth of the rods get replaced every six months, so that they have this consistency in heat. The oldest ones that are at their half life get taken out, the newest ones put in, and those are constantly radiated uh, changed. Now those what they call spent, which is through their half life get put into a cooling pond right there at the radioactive uh, facility. But they're still a danger. So what they do is they only put those there until they can get them encased and taken to a nuclear dumping facility like Pentex uh, up in Amarillo. Um, so the, you're not going to have that many spent rods at, at a nuclear facility. They're actually going to be transported to a burial facility. And, uh, you know, but they're going to be, there will be some, but what you're really worried about is, is another Fukushima. What you're really worried about is another Chernobyl uh, because that's what th th that radioactivity is going to be inside the actual reactor. And most of our, most of our plants have three reactors. And uh, both, well, Fukushima, I think they took out two reactors. And Chernobyl, I think they only took out one. I think only one melted down, but I, I could be wrong on that. Um, so... Um, Knowledge does conquer fear. Thank you, uh, Sumi. You're absolutely right. And that's what we want to do. Uh, we want to make you more and more aware so that you have more and more confidence and you can handle the situation as it happens. Um, what a great idea, Rat Trap 88. And thank you for being here. Uh, first time I've seen that name. Uh, yes, so so I am very concerned about you know another uh, what is it the the, the dome there in, in uh, New Orleans after Katrina where they had all the waste back up and everything else. I am so afraid my neighbors won't have their waste under. Scott and I are, are we've got it figured out. Bill and I have it figured out. Uh, Tommy, uh, you know we we pretty much know what we're going to do and we all have our own. Uh, little luggable loos, and, and we know what we're going to do. We're going to separate the liquid and the solid. We're going to, you know, a uh, fantastic book I just ordered, just got it last two weeks ago, uh, and it's fantastic. It's about how to uh, create a composting pile where you can t change human manure, uh, human waste, into manure uh, as, a, as a fertilizer. And the name of the book is Human Manure, H-U-M-A-N-U-R-E. So it's human manure, but the man is overlapping, okay? Uh, so that picture, no, it, it, the, the, that picture's not in this book. It, it, it was in another book. I'll see if I can't find it and share it with you. Um, uh,
Yes, and that's uh, Ferfal Aguirre is the author, uh, Manuel Ferfal Aguirre. Uh, he has a website. I'm, I'm sorry, he has a YouTube channel here, and it's called. Just look up uh, Ferfal, F-E-R-F-A-L, Aguirre, A-G-U-I-R-R-E. But he has his own. He, I just saw, he had a video just the other day that he's upset. Uh, what was it about? Um, oh, another economic collapse in Argentina going on. But he says Argentina. He doesn't say Argentina like we do. He says Argentina. But yeah, he's got three books out that are fantastic. I also recommend you read Soko Begovic. Uh, Soko is the guy who survived the Bosnian War, and he he was made famous by his first book, which was or it's not really a book as much as a collection of thoughts, uh, and it's called uh, "Surviving the Bosnian War: My Year in Hell" or something like that. I'll I'll find it and I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but he's got a. If you listen to those two guys. Uh, you know, I, I prefer, we have a lot of theory, a lot of people saying this is what's going to happen, you know, trying to predict what's going to happen. Why listen to people who are, are supposing what might happen? I listen to the guys who have lived through it. So Ferfal Aguirre in Argentina and uh, Selko Begovic in Bosnia during the Bosnian War in the 90s. Um, I, those two guys, they survived it. They're, they're teaching us what they did to survive and how they survived. And those are the guys I'm going to listen to instead of some of the guys who say, this is what's going to happen, okay? Uh, so, great question. Listen to Grandma. That's, uh, and welcome, by the way. I haven't seen your name before either. Uh, so, so that's one of the things. Let me get my, my everyday carry bag here real quick. Like it's right here next to me. That's why you need one of these, okay? Uh, so there are remote sensors, and there's this one. And uh, so this is a Geiger counter. This is the size of it uh, nowadays. I have another one that I have in my Faraday bag, but that's out in the garage. Uh, so I have two. I have this one and I have the one in the Faraday bag. And uh, so you want one of these because you want to know when it's safe outside. So what you're going to do is you're just basically going to stick it out, take a reading and bring it back in. Now, you don't want to do that too often. But one of the things, let me I keep this in here. So let me get it out. Uh, so one of the things you want to have is you want to have what's called a dosimeter, uh, D-O-S-I-M-E-T-E-R, dosimeter. Uh, and that's just this little card right here, okay? So you're going to put this little card, you're going to wear it as, as a, as a um, around with, I, I can take my crucifix, for example, and just put it here with my crucifix and wear this. And... Uh, that's going to tell you your total radioactive exposure over time, okay? So uh, this is total exposure over time, and this one tells you how much radioactivity is happening right now. So with one of those, you're going to be able to tell yourself whether or not it's safe to go outside. And then you're going to keep it so that, so that uh, you know, you can continue to take radioactive readings to make sure that you remain safe outside. Typically, typically. Uh, now, this is, I'm, I'm going back to my experience back during the uh, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. The, the, what they told us was plan on two weeks after the initial uh, exchange of, of, of uh, thermonuclear warheads. So figure you're going to stay, shelter indoors for two weeks, which is why having that water supply, that food supply, knowing which items you could safely cook with indoors, uh, that aren't going to cause carbon monoxide poisoning. All those different things are going to become extremely critical. And that's kind of what we're talking about here in, in this chapter, which is shelter the greatest need. Um, and, and I'm probably not explaining it 100% correct, so that's my fault too. Let me see if I can't find something on that for you, Stray Kitten, and I'll try to get it for you, okay? Uh, if, if it blows, but typically what we have seen is it doesn't blow as much as it melts, okay? Uh, 
I would be concerned if it were over something like the New Madrid fault line, uh, where it melts and causes a spreading of the fault line or something like that. Uh, but then again, this is we're, we're outside my area of expertise there, I'll be honest with you. Um, See, yeah. So the old uh, the old adage when I was in in elementary school, uh, we had the the nuclear fallout drills. We'd run inside uh, the center hallway of the school. We'd sit down with our backs against the wall, uh, bring our knees up so that uh, we had our arms around our knees, and then you'd put, tuck your head down between your knees, and then you'd take your hands and cover the back of your head, and that was the nuclear. Uh, blast protection exercise that we did in all of our schools. Um, so, so yeah, uh, in my opinion, you need both SUMI. Uh, so one of them is a basically a, a, uh, a low level uh, dose cemeter, a, a radiological meter, and the other one's a high level. So what you want to do is uh, you're going to use, and I forget which one's which, uh, but they say one of them is a radiological sampling meter. So that's going to be where you have to have higher doses. So that's going to be the one that usually has a removable wand where you can put it out there. Okay. And that's going to be where you want to have that outside. So it's going to tell you, yeah, there's still a lot of acti radioactivity out there. Then you have the, the uh, uh, Geiger counter, which is a lower radioactive level. And it's just giving you like maybe one, a, a maximum of two rads an hour is going to be the maximum reading it's going to have on it. Whereas the other one, you know, it's going to be such high doses on on the on the meter that you won't be able to tell the difference between one meter, one rad and five rads, or or two rads and five rads. It's going to be that's you know that broad of a range. It's going to go up to let's say five thousand rads. So if you've got this is is zero rads and five thousand rads, you can tell that the the uh, precision in between those is not very good. On the other hand, the other one let's say has from zero rads to five rads. Now you can see that you can put that into increments of one to five very easily. And that's the difference between the two is how big of a sampling or how many rads per hour is it going to give you a registration on? Um, so if you go with the, the lesser of the two, which is the Geiger counter, I believe, uh, then as long as you're maxed out, don't go outside. You know, you don't need to have the, the maximum reading one. Um, if you have the, the and that's what this one is this one maxes out at five so uh as long as it's got more as long as it's still reading more than five i'm not going out in it yeah. as a matter of fact remember what we talked about the very first week uh the rule one three twenty five so if it's more than three rads an hour i'm not going to go outside at all period okay So question is, how long will it take radiation to, to dissipate from the dirt so it's safe to plant? Um, so, so your dirt is not going to be radioactive, okay? So here's, here's the big thing. The radioactive, um, what's it called? Fusion or fission process takes place at the moment of blast, okay? So anything that is in contact with that fireball at the time of the bass blast is what is going to have the fusion or fission radioactive process in it. So what happens is if that fireball touches the earth, it basically irradiates the earth beneath that fireball. Now, it's super hot. And just like a hot air balloon, hot things rise. So it goes up into the air. And then as that dirt that radioactive dirt, now we're going to call it fallout. As it cools in that plume, it's going to fall back to Earth. The radioactive process has already taken place. So it is not going to irradiate the Earth underneath of it. It's not going to irradiate the water that it falls into. That dust itself is what is radioactive. So as long as you can remove that dust, anything that it came in contact with is good to go. So that's why they say all you have to do is rinse off or, or peel a potato, uh, for example. It, as long as you get that radioactive dust off the potato and you peel the potato and don't eat the peel, you're good to go. Um, 
as long as you filter your water, we'll get into that here in chapter six, I believe, uh, page, I believe it's 6.3, because I've argued that so often. No, it's eight. Uh, chapter eight, we're talking about water. As long as you use something like a uh, uh, coffee filter and filter your water, you're going to remove the vast majority of that radioactive dust, and that water is going to be safe to drink. So it, it doesn't irradiate the earth underneath. So if you just get a, a plow, uh, not a plow, if you get a rake and you remove, let's say, the top quarter inch of soil and move it and move it aside, then everything that's underneath that is still safe. OK, so that's I, I hope that that makes sense to you as far as an answer. Yes. So the original tests that were done in New Mexico, they actually had soldiers with goggles on, welding goggles. Uh, they also had ships in the Bikini Atoll. So the, before we found out the real effects of it, we had all kinds of stupid experiments to, uh, uh, with live human beings and with uh, equipment. We all are. We, we all have our limitations and we all, you know, have our expertise. And, and uh, that's like me being able to explain the, uh, the, the shadow effect. You know, I, I can get a guy on here who can probably explain it, but it's going to be above our heads, you know, as far as uh, trying to understand it. Okay, so Princess Kicking Butt says, the shadows were the people who were turned to ash near ground zero. When I was in Japan, I saw uh, a few of the shadows and it was eerie. Yeah, so so that's basically what happens is, is you've got this intense heat and, and think of it as being uh, a crematorium, okay? So you're basically just poof, burning that body. And, that, and, and we've also got simultaneous with that heat, we've got that blast pushing those ashes into... Uh, and melting it basically into concrete or asphalt or anything that's right there. So the, the two, the blast along with the heat, uh, takes the body parts and just puts them into the ground and causes what we call a shadow. Uh, and it's just residual human beings, what's left after they were incinerated. Uh So the heat was so intense that everything that did have something in front of it just got as hot as the same. Yeah. Very close, very close, little lone pepper. Thank you. That's a great explanation. Okay. So cesium-137 is one of... Uh, the radioactive elements they use to make nuclear bombs. Uh, uranium-235, there, there are several different things, okay? Uh, for example, when Chernobyl blew, I was stationed in Germany, and uh, so we had radioactive fallout, okay, when, 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 when it hit critical, and it kind of pushed all that stuff up into the air, then that cesium radioactive dust started blowing across Western Europe. So what happens is you've got the radioactive fallout, the dust coming down on the grass. What do cows eat? Cows eat grass. Had we gotten all of the cesium or the uranium or the plutonium off of the grass? No. So they ingested the radioactive materials. So we were not allowed to eat local dairy products, cheese. We weren't allowed to eat milk. We weren't allowed to eat local meat or beef products. Uh, beef, chicken, turkey, all those kinds of things for a year after Chernobyl uh, because of the fact that that fallout had gotten onto the grass or into the waters and the local wildlife ate it off of the grass or off of the, uh, um, out of the water. Okay. Okay. So we need to do two things. We need to be protected against the blast. The lower you are, the better off you are then we need to be protected against the radiation. So there's, there's a couple of things that you want to do for uh, protecting yourself against radiation. Number one, 
remember that radiation travels in one direction. Okay. So if you've got, um, let me, let me see how I can do this here. Uh, if you've got a, a door, right. And that radiation is coming from here, it's going to go straight in that door. Okay. On the other hand, if your door is like this and the radiation is coming this way, it's going to stop right there. It's not going to bend and go in this way. Okay. So radioactivity does not bend. It follows a straight path from the point of origin. So there's, we say that there's three things that you want to take into consideration when you're building your shelter. Okay. So num number one is time. The longer it takes for that radiation to get from to you from the point of origin, the less power it has. That's that theory of the, the, the half-life, okay? Uh, number two is they call it the inverse squared, okay? So if you think that, that it looks like this, right? So if you're up here, look at this. You're going to get at least three rays of radiation hitting you, okay? So, but these two over here are just barely hitting you. These two over here, they're kind of aimed away from you. You're not going to get the full effects of those. As you get further and further away, notice this one here over here is pointing way up over here. This one's pointing way up over here. They're going to miss you. So you're only getting a portion here. So what they say is the distance away, uh, one over the distance squared is the amount of reduction of uh, radiation you're going to have. So let's, let's say you are uh, two kilometers away. So at two kilometers away, you're going to have one over two squared or one fourth of the amount of radioactivity you'll be exposed to as if you were standing right there at ground zero. Does that make sense? So that's the second one, okay, is distance because that you don't have solid coming out. It's rays, okay? So the further away you are, the less rays are going to be hitting you. The third one is what they call mass. So how much protective insulation can you put between that radioactivity and you? So, uh, you know, they, they recommend strong things like at least 30 inches of packed earth, um, you know, one inch of lead. Uh, they've got all these different charts and, and th there's a great um, picture about it on page 41. They've got great charts on... Uh, how to calculate that. Um, they've got explanations and uh, structural ideas about how to turn your basement into a uh, uh, fallout shelter because we talked about this a little bit during the first meeting as well. Fallout hits that land and it's going to kind of accumulate right there at the ground floor of the building that you're in. So if you're in a three-story building, You've got radioactive dust that's on the roof. You've got radioactive dust accumulating around the walls on the ground floor. So where's the best place to be? The best place to be is going to be in that middle floor. So if you have a uh, fallout shelter built in that second floor, that's going to be where you're going to have the least exposure to radioactivity in comparison to the first or the third floor because of the roof and because of the exposure to the earth. Now, if you're underground, you're far better off. So, you know, there's lots of great explanations about how to build a uh, uh, fallout shelter in your home. Uh, that's what got me, as a matter of fact, what got me into prepping was during the uh, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. My next door neighbor, Lloyd, uh, was the neighborhood block CD warden. And so he built a cinder block fallout shelter in his backyard. So I kind of, as a 12-year-old boy, I was kind of, wow, this is neat stuff, and helped him build that. We had the old hand crank uh, air filter, uh, HEPA air filter to, to, you know, somebody had to be awake and pumping that thing in order to get uh, fresh air come in through the filter. Uh, we had a little corner for the potty. Uh, we had lifeboat rations. We, we had water in cans, canned water. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of things we've really made vast improvements over, over since 1962. Uh, so I think things are really looking better as far as their survivability. What we haven't done is we haven't kept up with the shelters. Okay. So if you can get sandbags and then fill them up and build a small uh, fallout shelter, um, then that, that would be great. 
make sure you get yourself some um, uh, plastic sheeting and some 100 mile an hour duct tape so that you can seal your doors so that you don't have that radioactive dust coming into your house uh, through your doors, through your windows, through your air conditioner vents and stuff like that. Uh, you know, then if you can do that kinds of stuff, I think you've got it made. And that's basically what we're talking about here in the hunker down chapter. So let's check one more time. Uh, and... That's what's your primary, just out of curiosity, Princess Kicking Butt. Well, thank you, Rat Trap. And I'm, uh, yeah, I love Steve. Uh, we, we did his books. Uh, that was our first fiction book review club. Love the Stonemont series. Can't wait for volume seven to come out. Uh, just absolutely great series. We interviewed him here, and, and he's going to be coming back after after the next book comes out. Uh, he is, gosh, he's got a wealth of information, and, and um, we just we just jive. I mean, he is he is phenomenal. For those of you who don't uh, follow Steve, by the way, his his YouTube channel is Integrative Preparedness. He usually puts out a twenty to twenty five minute video every day that's very much worth watching. So I, I strongly recommend that you watch that. Um, what a great idea. What a great idea. Just can't, yeah, I had never thought of that. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, according to this book, you need 30 inches um, to reduce it uh, to 2% of what it was uh, above that 30 inches. Uh, I believe that when they say five feet, that's reducing it down to something like one one thousandth of the radiation. So each, I think it's each six inches is a factor of reduction of, of packed earth. So, you know, every time you add six inches to it, you're going to reduce it by, I believe, or the amount of radiation that comes through by one half, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I, let, me, let me see if there's, if there's a something in here. Uh... I think there is. No, I, I will. I will find a, a source uh, that gives you a list of, of uh, reduction factors for the various types of uh, materials. But I think packed earth every six inches reduces. So, so let's say you have twenty rads and you have six inches, then you're going to have 10 rads. But if you have 12 inches, you're going to have one half of 10, which is five. But if you have 18, then you're going to have uh, one half of five, which is two and a half. And then if you have 24, then you're going to be down to one and a quarter. If you have 30, then you're going to be down to one. So that's basically how that, that works. If you have five feet, you're having it, what, uh, a total of 10 times? So, you know, you're going to hardly have anything expo as far as uh, exposure to radiation. Uh, oh, wow. I can't do Chinese. Um, number one, reading it's impossible for me. Uh, number two, I am tone deaf. So, uh, you know, one of my best friends in high school became a Vietnamese linguist and they have five different tones. I can't do it. I, I just, I just can't do it. I have a hard enough time with Russian and, and Indonesian. So, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine me having that. As a matter of fact, let me tell you, I was, I loved Hong Kong. Um, really loved it when Dell sent me there. Uh, the one place I felt the least uh, comfortable was Tokyo, uh, because very little is in English, at least in Hong Kong, everything was in both Chinese and English at that time. And, uh, in, in Tokyo, everything is Japanese and they don't speak English as much as most other places. And of course I don't read kanji. So I, uh, couldn't read anything, couldn't communicate with anybody. Uh, it took me four hours in a taxi and 
buku money uh, to find out that Dell headquarters was only three blocks walking distance away from where uh, I was um, staying, the hotel I was staying at. So unbelievable. Um, but anyhow, so would love to learn Chinese, but you know, there's, I know my limitations. So um, amen to you for, for being able to master that. That's just unbelievable. Um, Okay, so I think that's going to cut it for tonight. Next week, we're going to be uh, covering the next two chapters. Uh, so we're going to be talking about ventilation and cooling of shelters. Uh, what we talked about basically with making sure you have everything off and then having a HEPA filter so you can get good, clean air coming in. And then we're going to be talking about protection against fires and carbon monoxide. Both of those are going to be extremely important as well. Uh, so uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May uh, oh, I should have this memorized by now, but I don't. It's one of the fallacies of being an old fart. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Uh, the Lord look upon you kindly and grant you peace. Uh, so just do me a favor and thank you so much. What a wonderful crowd this evening. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for being respectful to each other. Thank you for supporting each other. Thank you for asking tough questions sometimes. Thank you for your understanding uh, that I don't have all the answers. Sometimes I have to look a lot of stuff up. I will try to get back to you with the answers. Um, and thank you for being so supportive and respectful of each other. I, I, I greatly, greatly appreciate that. And that's what makes this channel so great is the way you are with each other. So please uh, remember that we're all in this together. So we can come out the other side together, be kind, polite, and respectful to each other because togetherness is the key. So everybody, please have a safe evening. Read this book, get some good ideas, take care of yourself, and I'll see you on the other side one week from tonight. Bye-bye.